A few weeks ago, we talked about some of the worst roller coasters still in operation, but for every notorious coaster still out there, there are plenty of infamous defunct coasters worth noting. But out of the many infamous extinct attractions, only a few really stand out. So as voted on by the viewers, here are the top 10 infamous defunct roller coasters. But a quick note before we get started, I officially have Theme Park Crazy merchandise. So if you want to show your friends how Theme Park Crazy you are, head to the top link in the description. Number 10, Viper at New Jersey's Six Flags Great Adventure. Opened in 1995, closed in 2004. In more ways than one, Togo certainly has a rough reputation in the US with its many infamously bad ride installations. Viper at Six Flags Great Adventure is certainly no different. Years after the closure of the park's Ultra Twister, yet another Togo coaster was selected to fill the space. After seeing a new sit-down looping coaster concept at Togo's now defunct Ohio Test facility, Six Flags immediately purchased the prototype and sent it straight to New Jersey. Although it was originally set to be named and themed after the Clint Eastwood Western Unforgiven, market research found the name to be too dark for a roller coaster. Instead, Six Flags named the ride Viper, theming it to a deadly snake. In order to give it a more visually appealing snake-like appearance, Six Flags requested that more steel rings be added to the layout than in the original prototype. Despite the visual appeal though, the ride is often considered to be one of the worst roller coasters in history. Due to its flawed design, the trains would often put too much stress on the track's joints, and it constantly had to be re-welded as a result. This led to a cranium-smashing ride experience said to feel more like a car accident than an actual roller coaster. The ride's hard over-the-shoulder restraints made it feel even worse, and due to their awkward pull-down design, riders would often set them too low or too high. After years of high-maintenance demands and dwindling popularity, the coaster would close for good in 2000 2004, and demolition would begin the next year. Nowadays, the ride's former location is now the site of El Toro, an intimate prefabricated wooden coaster. Therefore, a coaster known for being undeniably terrible has been replaced by one that's widely acclaimed by enthusiasts all over the world. Now that's pretty awesome. Number 9. Steel Phantom at Pennsylvania's Kennywood. Opened in 1991, closed in 2000. Two years after Cedar Point's Magnum XL 200 broke the record for the tallest and fastest full-circuit steel coaster, another ride in Pittsburgh would take the latter record. In the late 1980s, Kennywood officials wanted to invest in a major steel coaster. With the exception of a standard Schwarzkopf shuttle loop, the park's major coasters were all wooden, and with the amusement industry investing in bigger and more intense attractions, a single loop wasn't enough. Instead, the park wanted something that would really draw in the crowds, but building a major steel coaster would be tricky, as Kennywood's tight layout and unique terrain would have to be taken into account. Enter American manufacturer Aerodynamics, who were tasked with building a massive steel looping coaster that would use the terrain to its advantage. Perhaps the most relevant way the terrain comes into play is the ride's second drop, which is actually taller than the first. While the ride itself was only 160 feet tall, the hilly terrain made the second drop 225 feet, the longest drop on Earth at the time. Add in four intense inversions and you've got Steel Phantom, a unique ride that was sure to catch the eye of enthusiasts. Unfortunately, the reception from its riders wasn't exactly what the park was expecting. Shortly after opening, riders would often complain of excessive headbanging on the over-the-shoulder restraints. Kennywood officials soon discovered the ride was going faster than it should after the second drop. To remedy this, the park would install a trim brake before the first inversion to reduce the amount of headbanging. Despite this trim though, the ride was still negatively received by enthusiasts. And after less than a decade of operation, the decision was made to completely redo the coaster. Shortly thereafter, the ride was was given new track by D.H. Morgan and the head-smacking inversions were removed. Today it operates as the critically acclaimed Phantom's Revenge, providing high-speed thrills and great airtime to its passengers. Needless to say, not too many people miss the original. Number 8. Hercules at Pennsylvania's Dorney Park. Opened in 1989, closed in 2003. Some wooden coasters are lovably bumpy, but others are just unbearably uncomfortable. There's no doubt that Hercules fell into the latter category. Built by the Din Corporation, this coaster first made its debut in 1989. At the time of its opening, it had the longest drop on any wooden roller coaster at 150 feet. At first glance, this seemed like a promising and aesthetically pleasing attraction, featuring a beautiful bank turn over the creek. Unfortunately, this turn would go on to be the most infamous part of the ride. Located immediately after the first drop, passengers hit this turn at full speed. The result was an immensely rough and unbearably brutal ride element that 
that was wildly criticized by enthusiasts. The coaster was so painful that it was often nicknamed Hurt Your Knees by said enthusiasts. Aside from its first turn, the coaster as a whole was said to be incredibly boring. The trains reportedly lost so much momentum during the layout that guests often thought that they would valley on the track. Over the years, the coaster's reputation would go from bad to worse, and its insane rattle would be consistently detested. By 2003, the park no longer saw the need for such a wildly disliked attraction. Soon enough, the whole thing was torn down and replaced with a new B&M floorless coaster named Hydra the Revenge. Needless to say, this short but sweet floorless coaster was a vast improvement over the old wooden coaster. Number 7. Cyclone at Ontario's Crystal Beach Opened in 1926, closed in 1946. You may not have heard of this coaster, and unless you're almost 100 years old, you probably haven't ridden it. But this ride has more than earned its reputation as one of the most psychotic roller coasters ever built. In the mid-1920s, famous designer Harry G. Traver came up with the Cyclone Safety Coaster. This wooden roller coaster was revolutionary for its time, featuring steep diving turns much like a modern-day GCI. Also like today's GCI coasters, it featured a steel support structure and was marketed as being easier to set up and invulnerable to fires and rot, both of which were a big problem with wooden coasters back in the day. While three of these coasters were built, the first of which certainly has the most infamous reputation and the most fascinating history. Built at Ontario, Canada's defunct Crystal Beach Amusement Park, the Cyclone first opened to the public in 1926. The coaster's intimidating, twisting layout immediately drew park goers towards it. This coaster was so intense and so relentlessly rough that countless riders would come off sick, unconscious, or even injured. To lower insurance costs, the park even stationed a registered nurse inside the station to attend to its passengers. There are even rumors about a nearby hot dog stand selling splints. During the coaster's lifespan, it would face numerous maintenance issues due to the ride's intensity putting immense stress on the structure. By 1946, the cost of maintaining such a hellish creation became too much for the park, and the ride would close on September 2nd that year. However, the coaster wasn't completely killed off. The Philadelphia Toboggan Company would take some of the ride's wood and steel to construct a new coaster named the Comet, with a much less painful out and back layout. Years after Crystal Beach's closure in 1989, this coaster was moved to the Great Escape in Queensbury, New York, where it continues to operate to this day. Number 6. The Great American Scream Machine at New Jersey Six Flags Great Adventure Opened in 1989, closed in 2010. In the 1980s, Six Flags Great Adventure was in quite a bit of a rough spot. After the infamous Haunted Castle fire that killed eight teenage guests, attendance sharply declined, and park officials needed a way to bring people back in. By 1987, the park began playing their biggest investment yet. Industry giant Aerodynamics was hired to build a massive looping coaster for the park, an epic scale mega looper that would feature a record breaking seven inversions. While the initial plans would be moved to Illinois Six Flags Great America, it wasn't long before work began on another mega looper in New Jersey. The new ride named Great American Scream Machine would take on the same patriotic name and theme as a PTC wooden coaster at Six Flags over Georgia. In 1989, the ride would open to the public, and the coaster was immediately a success. Great Adventure's attendance skyrocketed after its opening, and park historians consider it to be the one ride that saved the park from going under. Despite its success though, the ride was not without its issues. Shortly after its opening, the tops of the three vertical loops had to be replaced to reduce maintenance demands. Ironically, the first part of the coaster to be removed is now the only part left of it. The top of one of the loops can still be found in the Safari's Baboon exhibit, which is only accessible via a private tour nowadays. As for the coaster itself, it would go on to operate for 21 years. Each year that went by, the coaster would become rougher and rougher, and the Great American Scream Machine became known as a painful experience among enthusiasts. The violent rattle of the trains combined with the hard over the shoulder restraints left more than a few park guests with a splitting headache. Over the years, the park would open bigger, better, and smoother roller coasters, and the Scream Machine was considered to be obsolete among them. So after years of declining popularity and negative guest reception, the coaster was permanently scrapped in 2010, though its closing ceremony did draw quite a few people for one last ride, which just goes to show that despite the ride's reputation as being rough, it still had a sizable nostalgic fan base that still remembers it to this day. The year after it closed, it would be directly replaced with Green Lantern, a relocated B&M stand-up coaster from Kentucky Kingdom. However, some longtime fans of the park actually prefer the Scream Machine to Green Lantern. Plus, the fact that it pretty much saved Great Adventure from going
going under makes it a vital part of the park's history. If it weren't for this ride, we may not have Nitro or El Toro. Number 5. Flashback at California's Six Flags Magic Mountain Opened in 1992, closed in 2003. Long before their current roller coasters, Swiss manufacturer Intamin mainly worked with subcontractor Joe Vanola to make their thrill rides. Joe Vanola was a Swiss manufacturer where designers Walter Bulliger and Claude Mabillard got their start. These two designers would later go on to form the world-renowned B&M, which explains why the older Intamin rides have a similar track style. While working for Joe Vanola, Bulliger and Mabillard reportedly worked on the Space Diver, a one-of-a-kind roller coaster. Throughout its lifespan, the coaster would be considered by many to be one of the worst steel coasters ever built. The ride experience went as followed. After an initial chain lift, the trains would traverse a compact back-and-forth course. The coaster's defining feature was a set of hairpin drops. These drops plunge passengers downwards while also switching direction. These drops were notorious for how painful they were, especially with the ride's uncomfortable shoulder restraints. And according to YouTube user Sir Willow, the ride would slam passengers to the side with a bang. He further lambasted the ride by saying, quote, This may actually be the single worst roller coaster I've ever been on. It's clear to see that the ride's vicious headbanging and volatile transitions made it unpopular with guests, but those weren't the only problems that doomed this ride. In fact, the coaster was so loud that it couldn't run during the summer. This was due to its proximity to the water park, and officials didn't want the lifeguards to be distracted by the noise it would make. Eventually, Six Flags saw no use for this coaster, closing it in 2003 and removing it in 2007. It was then that the Space Diver went extinct, and it's certainly a roller coaster that Intamin would like to forget about. Number 4. Windjammer Surf Racers at California's Knott's Berry Farm Opened in 1997, closed in 2000. This is another one of Togo's disasters. After the closure of Knott's beloved Soapbox Racers, the park wanted to build a bigger and better racing coaster. That's what they they wanted at least. Instead, they got Windjammer Surf Racers. This surfing-themed attraction was a custom variation of Togo's Looping Mouse model, a coaster originally designed as a wild mouse with inversions. The Windjammer was much less of a wild mouse and more of a standard dueling coaster. This ride featured two separate tracks, a red one and a yellow one. Both tracks were meant to race each other, as passengers traversed the course filled with beach theming. Unfortunately, despite its promising appearance, things didn't exactly go as planned with this ride and the end result was downright terrible. First of all, the tracks were misaligned, leading to a brutally rough experience that smashed riders' heads like an angry gamer's keyboard. The ride was reportedly so broken that it couldn't even duel like it was supposed to. Plus, it was extremely sensitive to weather, and even a slight breeze would be enough to shut it down. The ride was so poorly received that Knott's Berry Farm sued Togo seeking $17 million in damages. The park argued that the ride's unreliability was an embarrassment, and that Togo failed to properly design the ride. While the lawsuit was eventually rejected by a jury, Togo's reputation never recovered, and they would close their American offices shortly after Windjammer closed. In total, this ride only operated for three years, making it one of the shortest-lived roller coasters of all time. Windjammer was soon replaced by Accelerator, an all-new Intamin Accelerator. Needless to say, this thrilling, fast-paced ride is far superior to Windjammer. Number 3. Mean Streak at Ohio Cedar Point opened in 1991, closed in 2016. After opening Magnum XL 200 in 1989, Cedar Point officials, as well as the amusement industry in general, aimed on outdoing themselves with bigger and bolder roller coasters. Since Magnum was the tallest full-circuit steel coaster, Cedar Point aimed at building the world's tallest wooden coaster as their next project. The DIN Corporation was hired to build the attraction, and it would end up being the last coaster they ever built. At a cost of $7.5 million, Mean Streak would stand at a top height of 161 feet and would hold the record for the tallest wooden roller coaster on Earth until Son of Beast debuted in 2000, but we'll get to that ride a little later. While initially very popular, it wasn't long before Mean Streak gained a reputation as an aggressively rough ride. The way it jackhammered passengers around its layout led some enthusiasts to consider it the worst wooden roller coaster on Earth. Even worse, a trim brake was installed on the first drop to prevent wear on the track, and nothing kills momentum quite like slowing down the first drop. The ride had its own maintenance department, and it was retracked almost every year to little effect. Still though, the ride did have its fans, including Mean Streak Henry, a brave senior citizen who rode the coaster over 16,000 times. Eventually, Cedar Point decided it was time to axe the streak, and would announce its closure in 2016. Since then,
again, the fine folks at Rybox track and is often considered to be the greatest roller coaster of all time. Talk about teaching an old dog new tricks. Number two, Drakenfire at Virginia's Busch Gardens Williamsburg. Opened in 1992, closed in 1998. For many, this ride is as sorely missed as an inflamed appendix. Originally, Busch Gardens wanted to install two sit-down coasters by Swiss manufacturer BNM, one for Tampa and one for Williamsburg. However, with the company just entering the coaster market at the time, they didn't feel they had the necessary resources or experience to take on both projects. While they would install the acclaimed Kumba at Busch Gardens Tampa, officials would hire Aerodynamics to build Drakenfire for Williamsburg instead. But the decision to switch manufacturers did cause quite an issue. The main problem was that Aero decided to try and replicate the design of B&M's coasters, which was the equivalent of a fry cook trying to make a panna cotta with strawberry coulis. Instead of their standard cross-beam support structure, Aero attempted to emulate B&M's tubular structure. Their lack of experience with the structure led to the ride's headbanging inversions, as they once again tried to copy B&M's style. The corkscrew after the mid-course brake run was especially infamous, and was removed from the layout shortly after the ride opened. All of this, in addition to the ride's technical issues, helped ensure the coaster a short lifespan, so in just six years, the ride closed for good. Despite how disliked it was, though, Busch Gardens Williamsburg recently sold Drakenfire t-shirts, and Defunct Land's video on the coaster racked up over half a million views. It just goes to show how fascinated people are with this coaster. Number 1. Son of Beast at Ohio's Kings Island Opened in 2000, closed in 2009. Based on its popularity, how could this not be number 1? I've talked about this coaster a few times before, but for those of you who don't know, Son of Beast was an incredibly ambitious attraction that formerly operated at Ohio's Kings Island. Meant to serve as a spiritual successor to the park's world-renowned wooden coaster, The Beast, Son of Beast was constructed by the Roller Coaster Corporation of America. With a 214-foot drop and a top speed of 78 miles per hour, this is the tallest and fastest wooden roller coaster ever built. In addition to its record-breaking stats, its signature element was an enormous vertical loop, the first inversion to be installed on a wooden roller coaster since the early 1900s. Initially, this ride seemed like a hit in the making, but its unmistakable flaws would end up dragging this attraction down into infamy. Not only did it feature a dull layout consisting of large, tedious helixes, but its earthquake-esque ride experience rattled and jerked riders along its unbearably rough track. Surprisingly enough, the only smooth part of the ride was said to be the loop, which provided a brief reprieve to the punishment riders endured. Between the manufacturer being fired during construction and the former park owner's misguided attempts to fix the ride, it's clear to see why it turned out as bad as it did. To sum it all up, the ride was a complete disaster, and it was plagued by design flaws, mechanical issues, and an overall cold reception from riders. The ride's reputation was made even worse by its notorious accident in 2006. Caused by a crack in the wooden support structure, this incident involved a train full of passengers being hospitalized after taking quite a brutal bump during the course. The park would try to fix the ride's issues with lighter trains, but they were unable to complete the coaster's loop, so officials had no choice but to dismantle the ride's signature inversion. After a later incident involving a guest alleging the ride gave her a brain injury, the coaster was shut down for good, and after many investigations, the decision was made to tear the troublesome ride down. Nowadays, the coaster space is partially taken up by Banshee, a B&M inverted coaster, with a memorial to Son of Beast inside the queue line. The coaster station is still standing, though the rest of the ride's former spot is said to be used for a new roller coaster. What exactly will it be though? We'll just have to wait and find out. Thanks for watching everyone. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or you can check out my website at themeparkcrazy.com. This is Theme Park Crazy, and I'll see you all next time.